Thanks. Well, welcome everybody. We're going to now begin the breakfast. Uh, my name is Ross Sandler. I'm a professor of law and director of the Center for New York City Law. And I welcome you uh, on behalf of New York Law School and Dean Anthony Crowell. This is the 169th City Law Breakfast in a series that began in 1994. And we're delighted to have so many old friends and new friends uh, attend the breakfast. Uh, thank you for attending and for making uh, City Law Breakfast an important public forum. I would like to thank the generous and loyal sponsors, uh, our founding sponsors who uh, sustained these breakfast series for so long. First, Consolidated Edison. Our good friends at Consolidated Edison have been very helpful from the very beginning, Verizon as well, and then the law firm of Greenberg Traurig. We thank all three of them, Consolidated Edison, Verizon, and the law firm of Greenberg Traurig. I also wanna thank the many gold star individual contributors who voluntarily contributed to support the breakfast when they signed up to attend. We are enormously grateful for the support of our Gold Star individual contributors. Today's speaker is Annette Gordon-Reed, the Carl M. Loeb University Professor at Harvard Law School. But more affectionately, our friend, colleague, and for 17 years, Professor of Law at New York Law School. Professor Gordon-Reed will speak on policing in America writing a new chapter. Uh, Professor Reed will, uh, Gordon Reed will take questions and comments following her prepared talk. To, to submit a question or comment, please use the Q&A function on your Zoom screen. We encourage you to submit a question or comment at any time during the presentation. The questions will be uh, presented to uh, Professor Gordon Reed after, her, after she speaks. Please identify yourself with your first and last name and your organization. Annette Gordon-Reed was born in Livingston, Texas and raised in Conroe, Texas, a small racially segregated town 40 miles north of Houston. In 1965, Annette Gordon-Reed was the first child to integrate the town's all white schools. It was a difficult time. As recounted in a National Endowment for the Humanities 2009 citation, Annette Gordon-Reed said of that period that she felt as if she were on display. She remembers delegations of white people coming to the classroom door to stare at her. Annette Gordon-Reed left Texas to attend and graduate from Dartmouth College and Harvard Law School. After law school, she worked at Kale Gordon, a Wall Street law firm, left to become the counsel to the New York City Board of Corrections and then came to New York Law School. At New York Law School, Professor Gordon-Reed was an engaged scholar, a favorite professor, and uh, an engaged colleague. In 1997, she produced her first book, Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemings, An American Controversy. Her subsequent scholarship and writing have led to many awards, including the Pulitzer Prize, a National Book Award, and a MacArthur Genius Award. We are delighted that Professor Gordon Reed has agreed to return to New York Law School and speak at a city law breakfast on the important topic of policing. Professor Gordon Reed, welcome back. The floor is yours. Thank you, Ross. It's great to be back virtually at New York Law School. I wish I could be down there in person, but we know circumstances don't allow that. Uh, this is an interesting day to be doing this. I guess we're all sort of a little on edge because of news about the president, but we will continue to talk about the topic at hand. My first class at New York Law School was criminal procedure. And I'm sure all of you know, many, most of you know that criminal procedure investigation, the class that I taught is about police encounters with citizens. The Fourth Amendment, the Fifth Amendment, the Sixth Amendment, but mainly in my class, the Fourth Amendment, search and seizure as police officers stop citizens for traffic violations, for suspicions of criminal activity or whatever. And I'm sure most of, many of you have heard about stop and frisk, for example, the thing that has been was such a contentious topic here in New York City a few years back, and it continues to be, but the issue sort of boiled over some years ago here in the city and other places. One of the things that I talked about with my students students sometimes who included police officers. That's the difference between, one of the differences between New York Law School and Harvard is that we actually had people who were on the force who were in classes, particularly when I taught at night. So I had the opportunity to have people 
in the audience, my students who had encountered police as citizens and people who were police officers themselves. And one of the things that we noticed and talked about was the racial dimension that exists in the criminal justice system um, with African-American men, particularly being, being in encounters with police officers. Sometimes, most of the time, nothing happens, but a lot of times things go wrong. And those were the things that we talked about in criminal procedure, search and seizure, and the exclusionary rule. Sometimes the questions about the use of force, was it appropriate? How much force was used? How much damage was done in a situation when officers searched someone's home? All of these things were important and had a racial component to it because black people are disproportionately involved in the criminal justice system. Now, there are a lot of questions and studies about why that is the case. It is clear that the African-American community is policed more than the white community. Um, if you take the issue of drugs, black people are more likely, more like this is one of the contentious parts about stop and frisk in Manhattan, is that black people were stopped and frisked more than whites. And there are studies that show there was a famous case out in uh, New Jersey about police stops on the highway, the disproportionate number of black motorists who were stopped. Um, and very often, and the, the records did not bear out that they were carrying drugs any more than white people, but they were stopped more than white people. So there's the racial component to this it has always been a part of the class that I taught. And sometimes it made for difficult moments. Uh, the, the classes are predominantly, in law school classes are predominantly white. And there was some discomfort sometimes about talking about race, but it was the elephant in the room. It was clear that most of the people being described in the cases were black or Latino. And we talked about what that meant, why that would be in a country that has had a racial problem from the very beginning of the origins of the country. So race and policing have always been, you know, racial have a racial component and political. It's a question of policing has a political aspect to it. I learned this even before I became a professor as Ross mentioned, growing up in a small Southern town, we had one black police officer. We got one black police officer during the, my childhood and it was a big deal to have a black police officer. The interesting thing about him was he was not allowed to arrest white people. So right there that tells you something about what policing was about in that society and policing in general. It was okay for whites to police black people but the lone black police officer could not arrest white people because that was an exercise of authority that he was not allowed to have. And it shows you a great deal about the relative positions of black and white people in that place. And that is a situation that was replicated in many places around the country. Maybe not, the, not, the, not being able to arrest a white person, but certainly uh, the notion that it was right and it made sense for white people to police black people. I'm a historian of the early American Republic, which basically means from the time of the revolution up until Andrew Jackson. And, and I also am a specialist in the subject of slavery. And the first real organized police activity that happened in the United States um, with large numbers of people, or great numbers of people would be slave patrols. That is a situ was a situation where white men in the community were deputized in effect or made to do patrols to make sure that African-American people, enslaved people who were going from a plantation or running errands or doing various things were who they were supposed to be and where they were supposed to be. So right there, this idea of, of black people as inherently suspicious took hold and was a part of Southern society certainly where most Blacks lived during uh, the early American Republic. And that attitude continued even after the end of slavery. Uh, we know about the rise of, of Knight Riders and eventually the Ku Klux Klan, which was in some ways is a terrorist organization, but it was an organization designed to police Black people's behavior through terror, to make people frightened, to go around and to move freely. We know about sundown towns, and these were towns, not just in the, in the South, but in the North as well, 
uh, where black people had to be indoors by a certain period of town before sundown. So you think about American citizens, you think about people living behind the Iron Curtain and all the restrictions and so forth that were placed upon people. Think about something like this happening in the United States of America with one particular race of people who were thought to be constructed as problems, who were constructed as inherently suspicious people and that justified this kind of action, extra policing and also curfews for them. Uh, my grandparents lived in a town that, uh, that you know, was sort of, what, that was in fact a sundown town that they were supposed to be um, indoors by night. And what that meant was not only could police officers bother them, other whites could bother them as well. So this whole attitude about making black people suspicious, making people the other has been with us from the very, very beginning. And as I talked in class, as we discussed these matters in class, through the discomfort, you know, working through the discomfort as best we could, it became apparent that this was a problem, that we had to think about policing in a broader way. And one of the things that happened, and this shows you how quickly the technological revolution has overtaken us, is that now in the past five or six years, there's been the phenomenon five or six years, I would say, the phenomenon of the video uh, of people, ordinary citizens who have camera phones, who are able to record what is going on with police and citizens. So when we were talking in class at NYLS, when I was talking in class at NYLS about policing, we would have a police report or a police officer would describe what had happened would do the narrative. And of course, if you know, if you get to create the, the narrative and that sort of, the game is pretty much over if people believe your narrative. And there is a presumption that police officers are telling the truth. So we would pick apart those narratives and say, is that credible? Is why did this person notice this particular suspect? Does it make sense that, it's, that race is not a part of all of this? We were able to do that but we had to use our imaginations in putting these kinds of stories together, reconstructing them. But now in very famous cases, we have videotapes of the way police officers encounter blacks, a black suspect, sometimes resulting in death, sometimes merely harassment on the part of, of police towards, uh, towards suspects. We've also seen the flip side. We've seen police officers encounter whites who, res who resist arrest, who speak uh, in derogatory terms to the officer and disrespectfully to the officer or aggressively to the officer. And we're able to see the difference, the patience that is used with those suspects versus suspects who are black. Now, obviously this is not a, it's not a controlled experiment. It's not the same officers, but it gives you a general sense of the difference in, in what whites can expect when they're encountering police, encountering police officers and what blacks can expect. I would always ask my students, and I began criminal procedure and I do that now because I teach it at Harvard. I ask them, do they basically trust police officers? And in the main, the majority of my students say that they do. In the past couple of years, the numbers are not as overwhelming as they used to be. But for the most part, my predominantly white students, a group of students say they trust police officers and my black students do not. Um, my black students, whether they have had encounters with police officers themselves, have this history of understanding that police play a different role in black communities than perhaps they play in white communities. White people have never had um, my white students may nev have never encountered police officers who talk to them disrespectfully, or they may not know of people who have been killed by the police. I recall a very famous situation when I was in high school with one of my brother's friends who was arrested for being drunk and uh, allegedly drunk and disorderly and was taken to the police station and he never came out. He was killed while he was there. He was a 17 year old boy and the story was that he had pulled a razor on a razor blade from some place, you know, where after he had been searched, apparently, allegedly, and lunged at the officer, and he was killed. 
and it was under suspicious circumstances. In that situation, the officer was tried, which is a big deal, uh, but he was eventually acquitted. But so the idea that police officer citizen encounters can result in death is something that a lot of black people with whom are, are from quite familiar and may not be to the same extent in the white community. So I ask about trusting police officers. And as I said, there, were, there was a sort of racial difference in the answer there. But now that we have videotapes, now that these tapes have sort of shown what, what can happen, I think it's changed people's attitudes. Now we've come to a point where some people think that the tapes are traumatic, that they may have served their purpose and that it doesn't make as much sense now to continue to show these kinds of acts because it then becomes a situation where it's normalized, where people think that this is just the way it is and it loses the power that they had at first. But I do think that it was an advance. It made people think about things differently to see, to actually be able to see what could happen in circumstances where people are complying, but still nevertheless end up dead or hurt by police officers. Now, we've had these tapes, we've had these moments, in, incredibly important moments in, in understandings about police officers, whether it's Trayvon Martin or Ferguson or other situations like that. Then we had, the circumstances with the death of George Floyd. And everything changed from that. And this is one of the things that I, I wanted to talk to you about this morning, about why there was a difference here. I don't have an answer, but I'm sure you all know that after George Floyd was killed by police officers, some people would say murdered by uh, police officers, there was a tremendous outpouring of outrage not just in the country, but all over the world. And in a way that was sort of stunning to me actually, because these things have happened before. Things have, we've seen people on tape before being killed, all of those things. What was it about this particular moment that made it so viscerally powerful, that made people move, that moved people to come out of their homes and protest, not just as I said, in the United States, but all over the world thousands of people marching to protest his killing. And we don't really know why, and maybe we can, in our discussion, you can sort of offer some of your theories about what made this point different. I, I think that there are a lot of things. Historians, when we look back and we try to explain a particular phenomenon, what we always try to avoid is being what we call monocausal, saying that there's one reason that this happened. Some people think it may be the political situation uh, with the presidency and with Congress and the court, the sort of polarization of the society and that makes people on edge, that has put us all on edge and makes us uh, well, suspect much more suspicious and angry and frustrated. And that this was a way of taking out frustration, getting the frustration out by protesting and coming out in, in thousands all across the country. Um, some people suggest that it was just the straw that broke the camel's back. There's no reason, no rational reason why this made a difference. It was an accumulation of outrages and that this was just one too much. The symbolism of a knee on a neck you know, is, is powerful as well because it's metaphorical understanding of what uh, police can mean what some people feel police mean to communities that are over policed. I have a pet theory that it has to do with COVID and the response to COVID, the fact that we were all sort of in a moment together. I mean, America is very much known for being individualistic and stand on your own two feet. There are good points about that, but there are also some points that are alienating. It keeps us atomized and separated from one another. Here was one of those rare circumstances where all of Americans all across the country were dealing with a situation that we knew was a threat to all of us. The lockdown, people were sheltering in place, people wearing masks, responsible people wearing masks and so forth. It was a joint effort. And I wonder if that and we were away from our normal environment, at least here in Manhattan, we were sort of, I'm in my apartment, 
we're ha we have to think about things in ways that we didn't before and we feel connected to people. And perhaps that contributed to it as well. People were looking at this tape, thinking about this situation and saying there, but for the grace of God, or saying this is, this is done in our name. We, we all have a part of this. This is part of who we are, <coughs> excuse me. So I think, I think that that may have contributed to it, but it's lots of different forces. For whatever reason, we are now thinking about policing in a different kind of way. Black Lives Matter, which was an organization um, which I separate, I, I draw a distinction between the concept Black Lives Matter and the organization. One doesn't have to agree with everything that the, the formal organization stands for to know that the basic notion that Black Lives Matter is important. It was never designed to suggest that white lives don't matter or lives of other people don't matter. It was a realization that something had to change in the way police officers dealt with the black community. It didn't matter. You couldn't just enact the death penalty because a person is acting out in a particular way. Uh, that you had to change our understandings about police citizens interactions. And Black Lives Matter was to say Black Lives Matter too <laughs> is really what that, the, the part of that that uh, is the salient feature and the important part of that particular movement. You know, before George Floyd, I think Black Lives Matter was not in eclipse, but it was not viewed favorably. Uh, the protest in the, in the NFL, um, and those things were not viewed favorably, but afterwards people were saying Black Lives Matter and they were writing it on the streets in New York City, I mean, excuse me, in Washington DC and in New York City as a matter of fact. It was all across the world, Black Lives Matter, which was generally taken, transformed into, or actually realized as the statement of anti-racism that it was. So a sea change in understanding about this particular, particular idea and this particular movement, that comes to the fore. People discussing the need for transforming the way police officers do their work, defund the police became another slogan. That means different things to different people. I, I had a, I was, I'm on Twitter and I had a, I don't like to dispute on Twitter. Twitter is supposed to be a fun spot for me, actually. You know, talk about the piano, talk about TV shows, fun things. I do talk about race and so forth, but not politics as much. But I got into uh, a dispute with somebody about this notion of defunding the police and what it actually means. Did people mean take away all the money from police officers, not having police anymore, uh, having some other kind of organization that surely would turn into something called the police, whether we called it something or not, that's what it would be. What did it actually mean? And there are people who are on the extreme end saying defund the police means exactly what it means. Defund the police, have other ways to deal with conflict in society. For p other people, defund the police means reforming the police departments that you have to be able to train people better than we are training people now. There's always room to do better. We can think about other places. We can think about things that, uh, the, things that other police departments around the world do. And it's, the difficulty here I have to say is that the Second Amendment makes, <laughs> makes policing in, in the United States different than it does in Scotland, for example. Uh, but there are things that we could do certainly to dealing with uh, police officers dealing with people who have mental health problems, uh, ways of de-escalation instead of escalation, which seems to be the American way. I don't know if that's the cowboy thing in us or not. There are different ways to deal with this. And so defund the police, even though people have different views about it, that is something that a large number of people support which I think for most of them means reform the police. But that isn't something I think had been on the table as much uh, before George Floyd and before the events of the past few months. That's been something that I probably would not have been stunned when I went, when I first started teaching at NYLS and was teaching criminal procedure, I would have been stunned to find out that ordinary Americans all across the country from 
not people who are not involved with the police, people who are not members of the police departments or anything, but civilians across the country support or thinking about now, um, thinking about police officing, policing now as a political issue is something that has to be dealt with. You know, the police, for the most part, when they have appeared in political campaigns, when they've been a part of the national conversation, it's been about getting tough on crime. But now, I mean, people are still interested in being tough on crime, but people are now interested in talking about how you do that. Is policing just about being punitive? Is it just about exercising power? Are there other ways to have a criminal justice system that prevents crime by dealing with youth unemployment, with youth you know, with nothing to do, with young people who have nothing to do but get into trouble? Perhaps changing understandings about the way we, we deal with drug abuse. All those kinds of things are on the table because people understand now that it, it affects citizenship. It affects the way African-American people and Latino people and others who are uh, feel that they are over-policed and are in fact over-policed in communities, the way they see themselves as citizens. I mean, one of the real questions that has existed in the United States from the very beginning was what, what is the status of African-Americans? What is the status of people of color? Are we full citizens or not? And the issue of policing implicates that. If African-American communities are policed more, if the vast majority of African-American people are not involved in crime, but if we are presumed to be involved in crime, if we are the objects of state action, much more so than other citizens, that creates distrust and it makes everything difficult. It makes education difficult. It makes moving around difficult. It makes the exercise of citizenship, of voting, all those kinds of things difficult. It's not just one discrete thing. This affects the entire system. And so I have been really happy and heartened to see the new interest in this because people understand that if you have large numbers, large numbers of members of your community who are not who don't feel safe, who don't feel that they're really a part of things, that affects the whole country. That affects everyone. So whatever we decide to do with police officing, whether def defunding the police, however you describe, uh, define that, we certainly know that something has to happen. Something has to change. And people are demanding that. I'm glad to see that there are now task force, there are now it's not just protesting. People are actually talking about this, beginning to talk about this in a substantive way. What would policing look like? I mean, one of the interesting things about all of this as a scholar of the, of the early American Republic is that thinking about how policing was done in the beginning, I mentioned the slave patrols at the start of all of this, but you know, modern policing I mean, the, is something that the founders probably would not have been able to conceive of. I mean, they were concerned about a standing army and they meant an army because they were concerned that people in power might be able to use such an army in ways that violated the rights of citizens that affected the Republic. What do you do about a New York City police force that is the size of an army? It's not called an army, it's not the military but that has tremendous power, not just in New York City, but all over the country. This, is some, this would have been something that, that's new to them and they would have wondered about all of that. What do you do if you have a president, for example, who has the support of such a group of people? Does that imperil the Republic? Does that imperil democracy? So there's a lot of things on the table from just day-to-day -day stop and frisk to our understanding of our role as citizens in a republic and our relationship to power and how that power is wielded, whether it's through a military or whether it's through police officers, paramilitary. This is, these are all issues here that are on the, on the table. And this is something that seems quaint. <laughs> my, my approach to criminal procedure and thinking about policing 17 years ago, uh, what seems quaint compared to the issues that we're facing now and issues that I never thought that I would be confronting uh, as I think about America's past and America's present. So with that, I'd like to take your questions because 
Well, I said we're going to stay on track here. Okay, thank you so much. That was really very stimulating and such a it's so wonderful to hear your voice and your thoughts about this. Um, I, I would like to ask just one question before I turn it over to, to Brian. Um, we're seeing um, not just police, but we're seeing um, uh, armed uh, civilians in, in states that allow people to carry weapons. And we see uh, confrontations uh, uh, in a way that um, uh, is sort of surprising, is very surprising to me. And I wonder if you see any historical parallels to uh, what we see in the, the, in the states that allow carry, carrying weapons at demonstrations. Well, um, we certainly have had vigilante justice <laughs> before, mm -hmm. uh, anti-Catholic bias, anti-Black uh, violence, people taking it upon themselves to police people. Uh, this, is, this is a part of our past. There have been moments, strikes against labor, um, you know, against people who are, you know, labor rising up to uh, invoke their rights and people opposing them. So at various moments we've seen this before. It just seems weird having it happen in modern times again, because as I said, technology means we get to see all of this in real time. And something can be happening off in Portland and you see these, you see people amassing to, to take back the streets or whatever. And it's frightening. So it has happened in the past, but we are much more aware of it now. And it has the effect maybe of giving other people ideas about all of this. And if you have public officials who seem to promote that or who won't condemn that, it's very, very scary. That's a, that's a component of this that makes it really, really frightening because you don't have word from the top saying, seriously, cut it out. You know this is outside of the rule of law. Well, thank you. Let me uh, uh, go back to, to Brian Kasuba. He's been collecting uh, questions and comments. Uh, he's the associate director of the Center for New York City Law, and we thank him and the staff of the center and the law school for their terrific work in putting together these breakfast, quite difficult uh, technology and all the uh, work that has to be done. We thank them so much. So let's uh, hand it over to Brian for the first question or comment. Thank you, Ross, and, and thank you, Professor gordon Ree. We have several questions that are in, and if participants want to ask, please use the Q&A function to submit your question. Uh, the first question comes from Victoria Augusta, uh, a city law intern at uh, New York Law School, 2L, and she asks, what advice do you give for law students trying to fight for racial justice during this era with um, highly polarized political parties, tensions running high, um, although voting is a direct way to make change, what else should we be, be doing to impact change? Well, I think you should be, that's a very good question. You should be working with local organizations that are interested in racial justice, volunteering to do that. You should be not only voting, but encouraging other people to vote. You might think about preparing to run for office. I mean, I, I think you need, we need good people to do that and young people should involve themselves in that process uh, as well. But I, I really do think that volunteering at, with other organizations, finding like-minded people to work with. Voting is important, but there are organizations as I'm sure you know, all around the city, um, actually, and all around the country that are interested in racial justice. So involving yourself with like-minded people is important. And also thinking about running for office or supporting people, finding candidates. That's the thing, finding candidates in local, uh, local races. One of the things that happens, I think a mistake that people have made is fixating solely on at the federal level but state government matters, local government matters and matter. And the, the presidential uh, election is very, very important, but going down, mar down ballot uh, is also important as well. And so I would encourage you to get involved with people who are making a difference in local politics and hoping for change that way. Okay, great. Um, our second question is from Allison Morpurgo. Uh, she thanks you for the topic, and she says she has a teenager. She has teenagers in New York City who are 
um, very politically engaged. And uh, she's marched in BLM protests and are very passionate. At the same time, they have ACAB signs in their rooms, which concerns her. With social media and youth um, and some other groups that have largely carried this message board, uh, its original intent, um, how can we balance the critical message that we need police reform, but still need police and can and should respect many of them and their dedication to protecting us? How can we make this message more nuanced is that possible anymore? I think it's possible. You have to keep trying to make it, it nuance is hard as, as the question suggests. I think there has to be a realistic assessment. And I know people don't like this idea realistic and pragmatism, uh, but I think it, it has to be made clear that there has to be some degree of order in society before society can work. And not all police officers are the same. I think there's definitely a problem. There's definitely a culture that I've, I've alluded to before that is problematic. I don't know what to do other than to talk to your, uh, your young people about the officers and initiatives that, you know, that are moving towards trying to do something different in society, to, to do things in a different way. And to suggest to them that they have, to, they have to involve themselves in or read about or be concerned about reforms or call for reforms that will make a difference. It doesn't seem likely, it doesn't seem at all in the cards that we're gonna get rid of police officers. That's not going to happen. I, I read a statistic that suggested 83% of Black people polled don't believe in defund the, the most extreme understanding about defund the police. It really does mean reform. And you have to remind them of history, that history that you can make efforts at change. And change does happen, but it, you have to be vigilant about it. I mean, getting rid of the police just as sort of a, as, as an answer without an understanding of what else you're going to build in its place is just not, it's just not pragmatic, it's just not pragmatic and it's not going to happen. All right, thank you. Our next question is from Veronica Rose, one of our City Law Fellows. Human Rights Watch released a report yesterday stating that the NYPD violated human rights law in its assault and mass arrest of protesters in the Bronx this past spring. How can we begin to reform policing when the NYPD respond so aggressively to public calls and protests for police reform? Well, citizens have to take action. I mean, you have to keep putting pressure on politicians. You have to vote for people who support reform and work for the election of people who support reform. Um, you can't you know, we're, they're supposed to be responsive to us. Government is supposed to be responsive to people. And one of the things that's happened, and it's easy to happen, is that we have sort of gone on automatic pilot as citizen thinking, citizens thinking that voting alone, voting is important, but you have to show up at places. You have, to, you have to protest. You have to keep these things on the front burner. I mean, we wouldn't have gotten to the point where we are now having these discussions without the thousands of people who are out on the, in the streets protesting and peacefully protesting about this, showing up in numbers to suggest that this is a serious question. We just can't, we can't afford to go home metaphorically and let, you know, let people decide that they get to the run of the place. This has to be something that comes from people. So political activism, showing up at meetings, voting, giving money if you have it. You just can't let up on all of this. And I do think that, there's, that there will be a way of making uh, some meaningful reforms. I think a lot of the things police, I gather from, you know, a lot of the things that police officers do are things that, or that they're involved in are not even things that they have to be involved in or things that they want to be involved in. And there are situations that escalate and there's all kinds of problems with that. I, 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 but I do think all kinds of problems with that. But I think that if you're not active, if you don't remain active in pressing, then they can just say, well, we don't want to do it. Well, that's not a sufficient answer. 
Our next question is from Jorge Lima Rodriguez. He asks, what is the role of attorneys in the movement towards racial justice? Well, attorneys have always been at the forefront of this, bringing cases, uh, test cases, talking to clients, all those kinds of things. Reform, Law lawyers can get involved in bar associations, uh, can get involved in politics in ways that uh, using their knowledge of the law to make new law if they, if they run for office and do various things. I think it's volunteering time, working with people who are, I mean, racial justice extends across a lot of different fronts. Uh, doing pro bono work for clients, representing people who don't have the means to, you know, to, to have representation. Just use what you learn as law and use the license that you have to try to effectuate change. But lawyers have always been at the forefront of reform movements and by working with, working through the law have helped to transform American society. So e either in the legal realm, you know, to do it, but also using, volunteering your time to help organizations that are working for racial, racial justice. Okay, our next question is from New York Law School professor David Chambrat. How would a President Biden deal with the racial dimension of policing? Well, it'll be interesting to see. David, thanks for that question. It'll be interesting to see. I mean, he has a running mate who has incurred the wrath of a number of people because she was a prosecutor and she's seen as a prosecutor, um, even though she's not, I mean, a traditional prosecutor. But uh, I think he will put in place people who are interested in this subject. I don't see him as any, he's certainly not a defund the police kind of person. I think he's more of a reformist. So it depends on whom he chooses to effectuate his criminal justice policy. But I, I, would, I would say that he's probably more traditional on this subject, but it depends on who he, he, he appoints, you know, who he, he places who puts in charge of, uh, of the policy here. But I would, I would expect him to be attentive to the issue because it's been raised so much. And I think African-American people are very interested in it and they've been his biggest supporters. He will want to have people who attend to this question. Him personally, I don't see him as a firebrand on this subject. Next question is from Professor Gloria J. Brown Marshall. Could you address the lack of prosecution focusing on the historical failure of our criminal justice prosecutorial system to protect victims of police violence? Well, this is a, this is a tough question because police and prosecutors um, go together in lots of ways and this they work with them and there might be in some instances sympathy for them but that's a real problem that's one way that I, I think that what they call so-called progressive prosecutors have a role to play in trying to to bring cases but the difficulty is we have to get rid of this notion of qualified immunity which makes it hard, um, you know, which makes dealing with po police officers, makes it difficult for them to, to, re to recover from police officers, at least in the civil context. Uh, but the sort of loyalty between prosecutors and police is something, is a tough nut to crack. And I think it really is something that we really, something we have to work on because prosecutors are supposed to be upholding justice. I mean, that is their, their goal is to, is to protect citizens. And that even means, that obviously means people who are the subject of police violence. It's difficult to indict. It's politically difficult for them. That doesn't mean that, that they shouldn't do it, but it's one of the most, one of the most pressing issues that we have here is how are we going to bring to justice people who have, who have done wrong during the course of policing. The, the difficulty of having police officers testify against one another, um, the loyalty that they display is, is a problem. 
Okay, our next question is from Eric Scarlett. To your point about standing armies, I'm thinking of the difference the framers observe between federal, state, and local control. To your, to your knowledge, did the framers express opinions on local armies like enormous police departments or even on the possible dangers of standing state militias? No, because they never thought of, I mean, the Second Amendment is, is some theorists think is really about suggesting that they're not, is sort of a reassurance to the states that they would be able to have state militia, that the militia could continue. Um, they didn't express an opinion about sort of large police forces because we didn't have them. I mean, policing as we know it, modern policing with forces of, of people uh, really starts in London. It, this starts in the 19th century, uh, past the founder's time. There was a, a constable, <coughs> people could be deputized, but this idea of massive numbers of people uh, as police officers was not something that they would have thought about because they didn't really exist in the same way in the 18th century. Um, we're not bound by what the founders thought, but it, to my mind, it's just, it's just an interesting idea to see them so interested and concerned about armies, armed people, how they might be used by un unscrupulous leaders. And for us to have now this group of people who are not soldiers, um, are not the militia in any way, but could ex but ex actually exercise an enormous amount of power over people. Okay, our next question is from Community Board 7 Chair Mark Diller. Uh, he's taken back by uh, your description of the first black police officers in your hometown and the limits on that police officer's purview. Uh, he welcomes your thoughts on whether changes in the way police are recruited, in addition to current discussions on training, might be seen as part of affecting change in the way police are perceived and perceived differently by different groups in our society. I think if, I think training, the level of training is essential. It might, I don't know if it would change people's attitudes right off the bat about police officers. I think it might change their behavior to the extent that training is able to change the behavior of the group of officers who are prone to using violence, who are prone to escalation. If if it, if it actually effectuates the change that I hope that it could, it might change attitudes, but just the mere existence of it without actual transformation, without any, any substantive change, I don't think it's going to make that much, much of a difference. I, I mentioned before the Second Amendment and the fact that so many of our citizens are armed makes comparisons to other countries more difficult I mean, people in great, in the UK, they have to worry about knives, but knives are not <laughs> as deadly as guns and not as deadly as automatic weapons. So I understand that police officers encountering people in the United States have a, there's a reasonable possibility that the person might be armed and that changes the calculus a bit. It doesn't explain the patience that, that they show with white suspects who could be armed as well. That's a racial question that, I don't think that policing by itself or even reform of policing will eliminate that problem. That's a, race is a problem that this country has dealt with from the beginning, racial attitudes, and that has to be a society wide change. And that's gonna be, that, that is something that's going to take time. So training, training I think can make a difference. And we have to think about that as a, as a, as a reform to teach, give people the tools for de-escalation, to figure out how to do these things, but it's complicated because of the fact that so many American citizens are armed and we have, the court says, the right to be armed. Okay, next question is from Mike Brady. Uh, what do you think of the, what do you think the key reforms that are needed in our police forces? Don't we also need reforms in our criminal legislation moving from a model of punishment to reform and prevention of uh, re -citizen, as well as addressing the underlying cause of crime? Absolutely. Yes, um, this is a, a problem. It's a cultural problem 
it's a countrywide problem. We have a much more punitive understanding about the criminal justice system. And again, I hate, I keep coming back to this, but it has been suggested, it's been theorized that the experience, the American experience with slavery, the American experience with conquest, we are still a young nation that was forged in aggression <laughs> and you know, a, a diverse nation where it's not a, a country that's supposed to be based upon a race, but a country that's based upon an idea that's, the, the, that's our aspiration. But we have tremendous amounts of racial division that, and I think it's affected the way people view punishment. And we are more punitive we, than other countries. And that's a cultural question as to why that's so. And, but even if whatever the origin was, we have to find a way to get out of that. So he's absolutely right. We, policing, all of these things are of a piece. Punishment, the will to punish people for the length of time we do and for the things we punish people for, um, we have to change that. So it's not going to be police reforms in the way of training, that's a, uh, that's a piece of it, but it's a broader question about the way we view crime and punishment in the United States. And so it does have to, have, have to happen on all different fronts, on a lot of different fronts. Okay, next question is from uh, Sarah Cobble, a student from our legal journalism course here at New York Law. She asked, could you continue to speak a bit more about your perspective on second amendment in the context of racial justice to what extent does it stand in the way of racial justice? In the effort to achieve racial justice, how important is it to focus on amending the Second Amendment? Um, I don't know. Uh, amending the Second Amendment, that's a, that's a tough one. Uh, the truth of the matter is, the Second Amendment doesn't even apply to African Americans, doesn't protect America, African Americans the way it protects white Americans. I mentioned before about, about videotapes and someone did a videotape of, of an African American man who has an automatic weapon who's sort of walk, in, in a place where he's allowed to do that. And immediately he's surrounded by police who pull guns. I mean, African Americans can't have, have more difficulty exercising second amendment rights than whites. Um, so even there, the, the bigger question of, of race and people's attitudes about black citizenship is an overhang to that, to even that idea. Uh, when blacks protect themselves, you don't see uh, second amendment enthusiasts protecting them or, or coming to their aid uh, to the same extent as they do whites. So I don't know that reforming the second amendment is going to what effect it would have on, on racial justice. That's a good question. And, and I'm fumfering around here because I don't, I don't have an answer for it, but I've never thought of it in that context. The main thing that I think of is how exercise of second amendment rights don't apply even to African-Americans in the same way as they do white. They don't protect if, to the extent that it is a protection blacks in the same way that, that it does whites. Okay, we have time for maybe one, two more questions. Um, this, it comes from Professor Rudy Titel from New York Law School. Uh, what can we learn from historical periods uh, of transforma transformation, um, example periods such as change of the civil rights period? Are we in such a period today? And do you support broader responses such have occurred in other countries? For example, commissions of inquiries on the question of policing possibly nationwide, and what about reparations? Oh, wow, nice little easy question there to end this. Um, I, I, you know, I really am, I'm, I'm skeptical about truth and reconciliation types of things at this particular moment. I think the country is really fractured at this point and we're witnessing you know, some really dark forces in, in our country, in our, in our society, some of the problems that we've had 
to, to the fore, coming to the fore in ways that I had not imagined that they would come back to sort of open assertions of white supremacy, all of those kinds of things. I don't know that we're healthy enough for this right now. I mean, do you know, I, I, there's, there's something has to happen. I agree that eventually this kind of thing has to happen, but we are really polarized. A good segment of the population is just not having this, this idea of, would not have this idea of, of truth and reconciliation. And people have to be ready for that. And I'm just not sure that we are ready for that particular moment, even though it's the thing that should happen. And that could just be my cynicism about it. Uh, those kinds of things are important and they can change society, but I think we'd be preaching to the choir at this point uh, on that question. We have to, we have a, we have a, a, a an issue with people who, who don't, who apparently don't believe in black citizenship and to sit down and talk to them and sort of explain to them why that is real. It's just not a thing to do right now. I'm, Maybe I'm too pessimistic about that. And I understand what has happened in other countries. I just don't know that we're ready for it yet. We don't seem to be ready for it yet. But who knows what's around the corner? I mean, just <laughs> 2020 has brought us so many surprises. Um, we don't know what direction we're in. It, it, it could be the beginning of something really good or it could be the beginning of something really bad. And the jury is still out on that question. Okay, and now uh, with a few minutes we have left, I'm going to turn it over to Dean and President Anthony Crow, um, as well as um, Vice Dean uh, Bill Lapiana for some closing comments and, and, and questions. Professor, thank you so much for this extraordinary talk. We really appreciate it and it's incredibly valuable to hear the historical perspectives um, I was really struck how you started out talking about what goes on in your classroom. And I can tell you, we're all struggling with issues of how to deal with um, systemic racism, how to have more thoughtful, more beneficial discussions with all of our students about that. And the, I agree with you that the confluence of COVID and what we are seeing with deep, deep uh, a, a deep, long and long history of uh, problematic police practices and violence against communities of color. Um, it really came to the fore um, this year. Uh, I can tell you that in my state and local government law course, uh, we are focusing on COVID and police reform as the two main topics. So <laughs> the entirety of state and local government law now is being taught through those two lenses. And obviously, uh, the backdrop is pretty powerful in which to do that. We've also at the law school just uh, became one of the founding law schools uh, for the ABA's Legal Education Police Practices Consortium. Mm -hmm. And that's going to provide a very powerful opportunity for law schools nationally to work together, but also individually in their own communities on police reform and giving law students uh, both practical opportunities as well as opportunities to uh, engage in thought leadership on this. And I'd love to hear some of your thoughts on um, perhaps how you're changing things up in your classroom this semester in light of everything. Mm -hmm. And so what you might suggest for us in that consortium to start focusing on because it's a very tactical opportunity that law students will have. Mm -hmm. Well, I, am, I wish I were teaching criminal procedure this semester. I'm not, I'm teaching um, legal, legal ethics, legal profession. And I, I've had people, what I, we're gonna have people, I've had guest speakers and we've been focusing on what COVID has meant, how it has changed law firms, law firm work. Um, we had the president of the ABA, you know, how the ABA is responding to all of this. I think what they, what they could do, I think would be to encourage students, encourage people I mentioned in one of my answers to become more active in organizations, to think about themselves, not just in terms of as the technicians of, of law, but people who have responsible, responsibility for the rule of law and for legal institutions and to become much more involved in all of that. I think 
my students are, have been hungry to find different ways to get involved, to make a difference, even while they're in law school and through volunteering and things of that nature. I, I think it's much more important for people to sort of to teach students or to have them think about themselves as being proactive in this way. We're not just, lawyers are active. It's not just waiting for a client or someone to come to us to do things, but to use whatever legal training, uh, whatever the, thinking like a lawyer, whatever those things are, critical thinking uh, to bring to bear on these questions. Great, thanks. Dean LaPiana. Annette, it's wonderful to see you and thank nice you so much you. for being yeah. here. Uh -huh. um, I agree with you that this is a remarkable time, uh, even more remarkable for those of us who can remember the 60s and mm -hmm. had hoped that this would, some of this could never happen again. Mm -hmm. It's a little like the end of I Claudius where the emperor is dying and he's writing his memoirs and he said, let's all the poisons in the mud come out. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. feeling like that but you're a historian so you know it's gonna well it's and then actually you have just you have just handed me my question which is <laughs> uh, it's probably self-interested for both you and me but when it comes to teaching our students to some degree are all of us in the in law school classrooms now historians or should we be well yes yes i think we are to some degree because they want to know as someone asked before, has this has this happened before? You know, has this have we been in this this moment before? And we have been not exactly in this moment. I don't think Faulkner's right. I think the past is dead. I think that echoes of the past come back, and there are things because we're human beings. We keep doing the same things. You know, some things like it. It's not exactly the same, but yeah, you have to explain where this stuff comes from. I mean, you know, people, I have young people who, who sometimes talk as if, well, this is different. You know, this, this moment has never, there's, we've never, we've never experienced anything like this, but we have experienced things like this. I don't know that we've had everything together, you know, pandemic, economic <laughs> dislocation, <laughs> partisanship. I mean, that's the thing. This is, that is an, this is an interesting confluence of events, but we are historians because you do have to, you have to think about how do we get here? You know, what, what are the components of all of this and how do we get out of it? So I've been thinking about history quite a bit. Everybody is trying to find a, a precedent and in perhaps finding a precedent, maybe finding a key to it. Are you, are you, are you teaching at all this semester or? Uh, only, only in the spring and the basic wills and trust course into which a lot of stuff about how we think about family and construct family relationships fits into this overall story very well indeed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I mean, even with legal profession, uh, certainly work, the work environment, but I'm talking to people now who were summer associates mm -hmm. online, you know, in places, what will the workplace look like? What will family relations look like? All of those kinds of things that are being, you know, having, uh, this is having an impact upon that they have to think about lawyering in a different kind of way. And, and, to, and to Anthony's question about what you can do in this particular moment, uh, to think about that in a different way, not just being passive, but being active as a part of, of, of solutions to these problems. Well, if you were to, if you were to ask or suggest people at our program today to read one document or one, one article book um, that brings it all together, what would you think that is at this moment in time? Brings it all together. Meaning, meaning to, to set the stage for a, a framework for action in the future, for them to be engaged citizens like you're talking about, which I think is so critically important. What sort of, what, what, what is a, what puts, what piece of scholarship puts it all into perspective and, and empowers and reinforces the need for, for action among our community? Well, any one piece of scholarship, what I would think, because I think this is time is very much like reconstruction. Mm -hmm. I would say Eric Foner's book on reconstruction that talks about how the society tries to put itself back together after a cataclysm, it talks about race, 
and the difficulty, it wasn't just enough to say, okay, the slaves are freed, the 14th Amendment, now everybody's a citizen. And that was, I mean, there had to be real, um, there had to be real steps taken and people were trying to do it. People had answers for it. The so-called radical Republicans or whatever, they had an answer for all of this and to see how that was thwarted and to see that race, that all of this founders on the crucible uh, on race as a question. So I think that there, it was a hopeful time. Things happened, right? Reconstruction wasn't a failure in the sense that nothing good ever happened in it. Things did happen in it. The failure was uh, the forces that came in to try to stop all of that. And that is, that's a critical moment in American history. And I, because I think we are living in something of a backlash from the election of Obama which many people thought was the turning point in America. And this, this meant we're home free. And now it's just gonna be, you know, straight to the top. <laughs> uh, in fact, it looks like redemption. And we, we may be in a, that, that kind of impulse to pull back. Uh, so I, I think that book to my mind is a warning sign and, and is very fruitful in thinking about how the country sort of the, the sort of um, problems the country's had from the very, very beginning could come in and foil the future, spoil a future. Are you suggesting in some part that we might be entering a new kind of era of reconstruction? I'm thinking that we are in a period in retrenchment after the historic election of an African-American president, eight mm -hmm. years of an African-American family, which I think in some ways is even more culturally problematic than his presidency mm -hmm. is a first lady and children and them as the symbol of America. I think people recoiled at that. I mean, many people were very happy about it. Even maybe even people who voted for him <laughs> then once they saw it in action had second thoughts about it. So sure. I mean, we're not in, we didn't, it's not, the country wasn't reconstructed. We didn't have a civil war over that kind of thing, but the response is a racial response, it's a cultural response, it's retrenchment. And I think that that, that would be helpful as a, as a guidepost. It's not the same, but it's the, the similar kind of moment when you think you're going forward and you end up going backward. I, just, I know this is not very helpful and very hopeful, but um, is, I'm just being, I'm it's being real. It's so realistic. And yeah. it's and I do think it is empowering to think to put things in these in this framework. I mean, it, it's it's a way you can do things differently. Mm -hmm. Ted Ross. <laughs> yes, I came back on. This was an exceptionally interesting colloquy. Uh, I think we if, if, um, we've gone over time, um, but I think this was really valuable that we did, and I really appreciate uh, Bill Lapiana and, and, and Dean Crowd joining you and. Um, what we can do is uh, if, uh, let me ask you and that, would you like to stay on a little bit longer um, or is this, should we end the breakfast? Um, we could stay on a little bit longer. Okay, let's go until uh, a quarter after 10 and I, I turn it back over to Dean Crowell. So, so following that discussion, you know, I, I just, I was just thinking um, we certainly aren't in a per se civil war, but there is a war of words, a war in this digital era. You talk about the use of technology to hold those, to, to hold people accountable, but also there's a level of incivility and a level of dissension that we see so profoundly because of uh, the digital medium through which we communicate. Um, what are your thoughts on how we can be better as a result of what we're seeing? I mean, uh, how do we foster a, a greater level of civility and, and broker common understanding um, at a time like this? Wow, that's, <laughs> Anthony, that's a, that's a tough question. I mean, the only way I can do it, I'm, I'm on Facebook frequently now, mainly to keep tabs with family and cousins and people all over, you know, not all over the world, mainly in Texas. Um, Twitter, uh, I'm on, 
I, the way I, I, I can only do what I can do. And what I do is to not tolerate that. When people get to the point of being uncivil, get to the point of being nasty, they're gone. Um, I don't, it's the way I conduct myself. I, I think we can only do, we can't make people civil. We can't make people adhere to our, um, our values. The only we can do is live our values. And the try, the, what I try to do there is to, to stay away from people who are, who, who want to engage in that kind of thing. Just yesterday, there was, you know, I made a, a perfectly um, rational, reasonable comment about um, how I have qualms about this notion that everybody's going to work from their house now, uh, that this is, that there are issues with that. And then somebody came on and said, stop peddling this nonsense and this is silly. And I, and I just said, okay, you're gone. Because, you know, what I said was not crazy, but the response was just over the top. But there's something about, well, it's clear. There's something about the, the disconnected it from the con connectedness from this that makes people say things that they would never say to anybody to their face. And that, that worries me. I mean, as we are in this kind of medium more often and medium where you're not talking to people, you don't, you think you know people, but you really don't know these folks. Um, the only thing you can do is just live your own values and to try to be an example to other people. Uh, but it's, it's terrible. I mean, I, I don't know, I don't understand why, even in a not face-to-face -face way, some of the things that people say that they would, the persona that they adopt on these, on these sites is really quite psychologically, it's fascinating. I do think that we have seen an increase in polarization um, as as the spread uh, and ubiquity of social media and, and the subscription to it has grown, so has the polarization or, or really a lack of community, even though those are on these, these sites and these, these platforms to build community, it tends to have a, a, a boomerang effect that it is not doing that. Yeah, well, I, you know, it, I think it comes because people are, I have followers or whatever, I have Facebook friends who are of differing political viewpoints, but we don't, we don't go at each other in the way that some people do on, on these sites. But I, I think what it is, is it's a way for you to gather everybody who agrees with you and to sort of curate a life where you're only hearing what you want to hear and when you hear something, a discordant note, the answer is, um, is, is over, it, you become overly aggressive, it's like the, the immune system <laughs> becoming, you know, hyper vigilant about things. And um, yeah, it, it, the polarization has, has increased because of that. And that, do you think it's fair to say then that in some ways the digital media have made it almost too safe to be outrageous? Uh, to be outrageous and to be outraged. <laughs> yeah, right. You're right. That's it. Both ends of it. Yeah, you know, in both senses of the word, it it fosters extreme behavior. Either way, I'm extremely outraged. The latest outrage, and or you know, to be outrageous. You're right. I mean, it, it makes it it makes the the stakes of humanity it it uh, of human interaction um, it lessens them, and you can just sort of you could act as if uh, you're dealing with people that you're not really talking to a human being. Exactly. Yes. And that's exactly. that, that, the thing that makes us who we are. If we lose that, that's, um, that's a real problem, <laughs> obviously an understatement. Which I guess is another reason why we have such a ferocious responsibility in the classroom to oh, yeah. make sure that those kinds of interactions don't happen. And don't happen. Yeah. We take account and we're responsible for what we say. Exactly. Well, we are, thank we are you. to forge that in the law school and in the classroom. Certainly chat room behavior now has become something yes. where we have to be very mindful of. Yeah. Yeah. And there is the challenges. Yeah. Ross? Yes, I, I, I want to thank all of you. Uh, I'm, I'm happy we had this colloquy. I want to thank Annette. Uh, for 
joining us. I hope you come back. Uh, this is a conversation we all want to have and to think about. And I thought your, your talk and your answers helped all of us understand more about the, where we are in the world today. And uh, we look forward to seeing you again and, write, and reading what you're writing and mm -hmm. uh, being with you again. Thank well, you so much. Thank you for being a colleague to all of us for so long at New York Law School. It was, a, it was one of the joys to be with you and to, and to have lunch with you and, and, mm -hmm. to, and to see what you were doing and then to enjoy and to be so proud of your accomplishments. Thank you so much. And thank you to the audience uh, for being with us. Uh, so uh, this has been a wonderful breakfast. Thank you all. We'll be back uh, in November uh, with the Corporation Council. Thank you so much. We'll see you in November. Thank you. Thank you for having me.